This is a film dimension interview. I'm speaking with Ricky Glor. Ricky, how are you? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing, sir? I'm I'm doing very, very good. Very, very good. Good, good to speak to you. Um, we're gonna be talking about lots of things, but we're gonna be talking nice. about all nice your friends. You. Yeah, thank you. We're gonna be talking about uh, all your friends are dead, um, which is your project you're working on now, and you're just about to launch a Kickstarter. But um, before we get to that, um, how how did you get involved with making making films? Uh, this isn't your first film, right? You've done you've done no this. This is my first feature film. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. yeah. Um, before this, in the last about year, I filmed two horror short films called Call and then one called Racist, which are just currently in festivals right now. And both of those, I worked with a, a fantastic special effects, visual effects, practical effects team that is also working on All Your Friends Are Dead. And they have oh. a, a pretty extensive background of working on some notable horror films which once the kick once you go to the kickstarter you'll see all those and you'll be like oh that's amazing like yeah it sure. sounds like a really a really good uh a real good film um probably first things that i ever shot was uh, a sketch comedy cable access show <clears throat> with a group of friends of mine uh probably in the tail end of high school i mean even before that like in eighth grade a friend of mine whose dad was a freelance film uh a cameraman for local sporting events um he had some old film equipment that we used to film some sketch comedy sketches in his basement cool. and when we were a lot younger cool so it's just basically as i think a lot of people do you know if, if you're a fan of film you like films you watch films um somehow you get to the point where like let's let's try to make a film you know that'd be fun <laughs> Um, until you start doing well, and it. I grew up. I grew up in the '90s, and that was as I was getting older and you know starting to go to to movies myself, go to the theater. Uh, I also have a, a brother who's five years older than me, so we started going to the movies. He used to take me every now and then together. And that the '90s was the age of the indie film, and you know there were a lot of stories about like how you could be a filmmaker or like. Mm -hmm. Robert Rodriguez with his book Rebel Without a Crew talking about how he made El Mariachi for I think like $10,000 or $7,000. Yeah. Kevin Smith talking about how he made Clerks for $27,000. Or Quentin Tarantino, someone who is a cinephile and had a, a what it seemed like at the time, like a useless movie knowledge, like a, a big mm -hmm. collection of useless movie knowledge, put it to task by writing scripts and then getting acknowledged. I mean, he's someone who worked at a video store in Hollywood yeah. and his love of films, he was able to parlay that into making the kind of films that he always enjoyed growing up. Do you think that the comparison between the 90s and yeah, I mean, every, everyone's aware of people like Tarantino obviously and, and the other people you've mentioned. Um, do you still think that that is achievable today in the current climate the way films are made these days i weirdly think that it is actually something i think it's going to be a, i think there's going to be a resurgence in the indie film i think we lost a little bit i think the um the indie film boom of the 90s became corporate in the early 2000s with uh studios like fox searchlight where they started saying like oh these are indie films. And it's like, mm, your cast has Johnny Depp and Dustin Hoffman in a budget of $50 million. I don't know if you can call that an indie film. Um, mm. But they did start taking a chance, the studio system, on some uh, more interesting filmmakers and making some quirkier films with uh, bigger budgets. But then that became the Hollywood blockbuster. Uh, there ended up being this mentality that a less your movie was a superhero movie or larger than life kind of action movie you didn't deserve to be in the multiplex or be on what yeah. is like a thousand screens um i know there was a pre-covid there was a methodology of that like oh you should you only have to go to the theater to see these big spectacle movies because you know you want to see it uh, the, the best sound the biggest way possible but I actually disagree with that. Edgar Wright and Quentin Tarantino said something that supported um, something I hadn't articulated yet. But the reason why I think it's so important to go to the smaller films is smaller films are a little bit more DIY, especially if they have a, if they're a mother of invention, like 
a mother of invention kind of movie where they're making it up on the fly or they're doing what, what they can with a shoestring budget. A lot of them focus on dialogue. And I think those movies are actually the ones that you should have to go see at a theater because they deserve your full attention in a dark room, being able to hear it, being able to see it, having no distractions, letting the pace of the film, like action movies, yeah, a good action movie, the pace it will be very quick and uh, frenetic and will will go by very quickly. But like a more indie film that has something to say I think it loses a lot when you're just streaming it on home and at your TV and you have the distractions yeah. and you can get, pause it and get up and go to the bathroom. You can't be really swept by the emotion or the kind of um, mission statement that the movie is trying to, to do or a way that it's trying to make you feel because you're, you're stopping it or you're being distracted. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. I've not heard many people uh, put it quite like that. And, you, and I, I 100% agree. It's almost like, the big spectacular films, the superhero films, the Jurassic Park, Speed, what, whatever it is, Matrix Four or whatever, is mm-hmm. it's almost um, yes, people watch them in the cinema because of the sound and everything else, but they're almost designed for TV because they're much more like television in terms of it's action talking, action talking, and yet you're not focusing as much as you would do in say an indie film that basically doesn't have the budget but it has one would hope a, a snappier dialogue. Um, two people having or three people having conversation um, and yeah there's something about that being in the cinema you're not distracted and it's funny I always feel like the the indie art houses the indie art houses are less comfortable uh, they're smaller and they're older and they're usually older movie theaters that time has kind of forgotten and they mm-hmm. have less amount of screens but I always find that it's so interesting that like these big bombastic uh, Hollywood movies which again, I have nothing against, mm. are in like these multiplexes that have like now like lounge chairs and yeah, basically like tiny beds for you to like lay on and just be really for you to glutton out and be fed a four course mm. meal now at where it's like the indie films where they make you feel more or like an elicit a visceral reaction. Yeah, you're already very uncomfortable. Like the springs in the seats are gone. There's a little bit of a musky smell in the theater. Sure. Um, I just I find it very interesting how we it's almost like the indie films are for diehards and for people that do really care about filmmaking so it's like all right we know you want to see this movie but we're not going to make it easy for you the the, the, uh, art house theater is going to be in the bad part of town and (laughs) yeah yeah Um, so I, I, I don't know it's I think because I think one of the, the good things about the past year was a lot of international festivals had to open up and rechange their thinking to how they would accept films and how their festivals would go on. And one of the benefits of streaming is that you could buy a ticket for a weekend of a festival. And I know this sounds apocryphal from what I just said about going to the theater, but for festivals in these smaller films that may have never, or even like short films may have never gotten outside of say like New Zealand or Mm -hmm. Germany or Russia, people are now the one good thing about the internet and connecting people is that they are getting more experienced uh, viewers and their taste levels are broadening a bit. And I, I think that is what's going to help usher in this new wave of indie filmmaking because the equipment, like I filmed my last short uh, on my iPhone with equipment from Moondog Labs. They make, uh, they make some lenses and they make some, uh, some filters for your phone to make uh, mobile filming easier. And it was nice because I couldn't have a large crew or, or too many people on set due to the regulations of COVID and stuff. But I know some filmmakers like Joe Dante kind of complain. They're like, oh, kids now have it so easy. They could shoot, edit, and color all on their phone now. And it's like, yeah, but only people that really have something to say will put in the time and effort that is still required to yeah, make something exactly. and make something watchable. Yeah, you still need an idea. You need a script. You need, you need something that's worth getting up at five in the morning to do. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. And and I also often think, you know, the last, say, two years, that it's been coming for a long time, obviously, but, you know, the, the conversation that in the film industry is having now with, with diversity and what that means um, 
both in front of the camera and behind the camera and everything else, more women, more more people from different um, backgrounds, um, minorities, that sort of thing. But it's the, the, the one thing that doesn't seem or is not seeping into the mainstream as much, but perhaps will come next is, well, what about the diversity of stories? You know, that mm -hmm. it's great if you've got directors that are first time directors and from, from different backgrounds or they're, they're not all just like white men say, but um, you still have to have people thinking differently. And you mean differently. look like this? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, uh, a middle-aged like, white guy with a beard. Look, yeah. <laughs> look, I'm, I'm also, yeah, fast approaching middle-aged white guy. So I've, I've got nothing against them and we've got something to say as well. But, but if, if, if even more so it's, it's, it's up to say us to come and tell different stories, you know, but again, it's, it's, there's no point saying, well, all our cast are all women or every mm -hmm. single person who's been in this film is from every other country apart from North America. But if you're telling the same old story, the same dynamics and everything else, then then so what? But so so in, I think indie film has a story that has has a position to basically it has to um, push the boundaries, has to be more creative and just you know, you can tell the same story that has been told since the beginning of cinema, but um, mm -hmm. in different ways. And it's not just, well, I've seen that 20 other times, you know, just with smaller and smaller budgets. <laughs> you know, that the, there is something to be said for doing things uh, differently. And I think that that's, that's... Yeah, I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing that in... The... I think we're seeing that in the horror genre. I think we're seeing yeah. that in some of our uh, best com comedies. Uh, so I'm a comedian and I, I've been doing comedy for a long time, improv, sketch and stand up. Most notably, I've released my first album last year, I released my first comedy special. And when it came to putting together my first feature film, my co-director and the person I developed the story with, Nicholas Hyen, he's like, well, let's make a comedy. Let's make a comedy film. He's like, I, I don't want to make a horror. Um, and I was like, well, one, horror is the most marketable. Like, it can fall in the spectrum of, of being good, being bad, and entertaining in its own ways. But I was like, comedy? Comedy is such a time capsule. And mm -hmm. I'm just honestly not funny enough. And I just overthink how what that comedy would be like. It would really have to be something earnest in its uh, uh, comedy sensibilities, kind of like someone who I think has done it very well. And I think the movie will stay in the test of time a little bit more than say some of the um, sex comedies of the seventies, eighties or nineties, early two thousands is Greta Gerwig and Lady Bird. I think that is, they always say coming of age movies tend to do better and last a little bit longer. But I think when we talk about like having that diversity, that voice, maybe telling a coming of age story isn't something necessarily new and it does mm -hmm. kind of feel like a John Hughes movie, maybe a little less uh, silly. Um, I think it is still something new because we just haven't seen as much of that voice prevalent in the comedy genre. What, as it's an interesting um, opportunity now to, to speak to someone who's from a comedy background and sort of stand up and that sort of thing but seeping into films from your experience what's it like being um a comic these days with cancel culture and that sort of thing and certain not everyone certain people's ideas of there's things you can't say because of course i'm, I'm a big fan of comedies that comedians and it's always been that that's where you go to get the cutting edge to get to get the latest kind of idea crazy ideas going back and forth and it relies on the fact that people are getting up and saying whatever the fuck they want. And that's the chaotic thing. That's what makes comedy um, so exciting. Um, just what's your opinion on that? And how does that seep into film? I, I am someone, um, <laughs> I am not very political in my, my comedy. I, might, I have political opinions, but it's definitely not my, uh, my forte. I, I love political comedians. It's just not what I do or do sure. well. I grew up being raised on the Martin and Lewis uh, comedy movies, the Hope and Crosby road pictures, Marx Brothers, uh, Abbott and Costello, and then Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which is that perfect blend of universal horror and comedy. Um, then the comedies I started kind of gravitating towards, the comedians were like Phil Hartman on Saturday Night Live watching reruns. And he, 
his comedy always came from a place of, I think, truth. And I think uh, uh, an emotional grounded place, even when he was very absurd. Um, and so I, I definitely was pulled to him even though he played a lot of different characters and did impressions, I always felt like there was a genuine honesty coming from him. Um, my comedy, it was interesting. I actually auditioned for uh, a show in the States called uh, NBC's Bring the Funny, which consisted of stand-up comedians, sketch comedians, uh, and improvised teams, I think improv teams. And I got in front of the producers for the audition and I pretty much look like this with a, a shorter beard. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're from Kentucky and you you have a young family. You know, well, at that time, my wife was pregnant. Um, and they're like, OK, so would you say you're more conservative leaning and does your family go to church? They were clearly wanting to have this blue collar comedy kind of narrative of like this kind of Larry the Cable Guy or Jeff Foxworthy or Bill Engvall. And. I know immediately how I lost them because they didn't know how to brand me. I was like, no, uh, I'm pretty liberal and I'm agnostic. Uh, and they were like, oh, we don't, we don't know how to sell you. Yeah, yeah, we, we can't fit you in a box. Even though my, uh, my comedy is, uh, it's definitely evolved over the years. Yes, yes, it is, it is hard to be like, oh yeah, we can really go after middle America with this guy. You know, he'll be something that's, because a lot of comedians... Uh, tend to be um a little more risque than i am i'm a, pretty much a clean comedian and it's kind of rare that i'm not conservative and ultra religious um but what that means is with my comedy and how it's evolved it's become way more personal the more that i've lived when i was a young comedian starting off and when i was 19 um i just wrote jokes it was just yeah. all jokes and just kind of loose observations which doesn't come with much weight because I was only 19 years old I really hadn't lived of much of a life and so when I got older I actually started uh re-examining things in my life like going uh growing up in Kentucky and going to a school where our mascot was the camel and that being in Kentucky and how kind of ludicrous that was and our colors being purple and gold and it's like wow it was bad enough that we were the camels and now we're purple and gold you know colors just like the camel um and so examining some of my home life uh stuff about my what it's like being married um being a little meta of acknowledging that a lot of comedians will rag or or make fun of their significant others and kind of like posturing that and being like yeah a lot of comedians do this and i'm like and i'm going to as well here's some things i don't understand about my wife um that having that sensibility where I can almost play what's called four corners and that's of the United States. I don't come in strong with a lot of different viewpoints and I, because I don't talk about politics really and I don't talk about religion. It's pretty, I'm pretty accessible almost anywhere in the United States. Like even hmm. being a, uh, being in my 30s and doing even colleges I thought oh man this is this is not they're not going to want to hear me talk about being a, a new dad and being a husband but you know that's not my whole act a, a part of my act is I talk about things that I find humorous in horror movies um mm -hmm. one of it which being that like my wife loves watching horror movies all up until a dog appears in a horror movie um and then there's a bit about that there's a bit about horror movies aren't realistic with shower scenes because it's always like oh, a buxom like sexy woman who's just like lathering up just like one area of her boob for like 10 minutes uh when it's like well that's not realistic because they never show like someone who looks like me in the shower scrubbing <laughs> yeah, yeah. areas of my body that i that I never knew existed singing a top sure. 40s hit song, you know, off key. Um, but so like that's, I I've definitely have gotten more comfortable with talking about what I want to talk about and is, is as easy as it sounds, audiences tell when you are passionate about what you're talking about. There's a, there's a confidence level that they're like, Oh, we can see that you like talking about this and we like that we know that you're you know this isn't a shtick this is yeah. this is i'm not being real as in a sense of like i'm not sitting on a psychiatrist's couch just unloading my emotions to the audience 
but they know that the things I'm talking about are the thing are things that bring me joy. And then there was a relatability because they're like, yeah, you know what? I've never thought about that, but that is true about horror movies or like, oh, especially uh, women. Whenever I bring up about my wife hating dogs getting killed in horror movies, they're always like slapping their husband or they're always just like, yep, that's me. That's me. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've not really I've not really had a hard time with um, sure. with having to walk the line of what appropriate is or isn't. I think. I think being cognizant of open communication and a dialogue with the audience and with other comedians and just people in general help knowing where you can go and where you can't go. And if you say something that personally makes you feel like, oh, you know what? I don't know if I like propagating like that idea to an audience. Um, Like there was a bit that I I have about um, men being the problem. Like we're the problem. Like we've, we demean women like we've created all the bad stereotypes and the nicknames it's all white men we're the issue like junk in the trunk like there's no way a woman came up with the phrase junk in the trunk to describe what their rear end looked like that was a man um and then i go into a bit about like if you want to objectify women like if you gotta objectify women like make them compliments and for a while without even realizing it when I went into the act out, when I started doing the, the compliments to objectify women, um, which I guess that is kind of a political, it's kind of a, a satirizing bit. But um, I realized recently that I've been doing it in kind of an urban accent of maybe a person of color. Uh, okay. not, like, not like hardcore, but just like slightly. And I started thinking about that and I was like, oh, I don't know why I'm doing that. I'm like, like that's clearly some internal racism uh, of myself or a stereotype that I'm just playing into. I was like, because easily based on how I look, that act out could be done in the voice of a hillbilly. And so I, I changed it a couple weekends ago and I'm like, yeah, the bit still works. And I don't feel gross, you know, stereotyping uh, a, a, a group of people, a race of people or a class of a person to an audience because there might be some people in the audience that may have thought it was funny for reasons they didn't know and just perpetuating stereotypes that they are mm-hmm. already have. Sure. Um, so, so how, how does your, your experience in, in, in this come into play in terms of writing all your friends are dead? Um, where you think might be slightly different if you were just a, um, a screenwriter without the stand-up I- experience? In t- were, you, were you coming at this from a different perspective? Like you weren't trying to make it funny, even though it is a sort of horror, but would you say it has a, a, a comedy element to it? Or would you say it's more... Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think it's interesting a lot of... Um comedians are evolving into horror and thriller suspense writers and filmmakers like Danny McBride and David Gordon Green who are notoriously known for making these comedic these outlandish comedic shows are now at the helm of the Halloween franchise Um, Mm -hmm. you obviously you clearly have Jordan Peele which is the most famous of them who made the transition from Mad TV to Key and Peele to get out and now he's dubbed the maestro of what would be called, and I know some people don't like this term, of elevated horror, poignant horror that makes you think that's dealing with social uh, issues. Um, I definitely, being a fan of the genre, um, I'm I, I'm definitely observing, like say the slasher film. So say like Friday the 13th series. Uh, I'm always boggled uh, by the fact that those movies I think are only entertaining for about 20 minutes. And it's usually like the last 15 to 20 minutes because they're filled with disposable characters that you don't really care about. And you just, yeah. you know, for after watching one after the other that you don't need to care about them. The, the filmmakers yeah. don't want you to care about them. And so when writing this script, I definitely, uh, Nick Heinz and I, when we developed the story, we're both 35 years old and we're both 
doing what we want to do and we don't really have any regrets. But one thing we acknowledged was we were like, oh, if we never made a feature film 15 years from now, I think we'd regret that. And I don't, I don't want to have that regret. And so we started talking about like, well, what if our lives would have went differently? And the lead character who we follow in All Your Friends Are Dead is semi-autobiographically based on me, where in real life, I got hurt playing sports my junior year and then transitioned to theater. So this movie posits, well, what if I would have gotten hurt in college on a sports scholarship? And then now that I don't have the safety net of these friends uh, and being young, um, maybe I became an alcoholic. Maybe I became a depressive. Maybe I became dependent on pain medication for the pain yeah. of the injury. And then I just never got traction in life and woke up one day and I was 35 and realized that probably the best years of my life were behind me and now I'm alone. Mm. And so that character then writes uh, an email to his estranged friends who are basically like the breakfast club grown up yeah. uh, or what if the teen slasher kid grew up and he says, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. I haven't talked to any of you in a while. You haven't reached out to me. I haven't reached out to you. I get it. Um, I, I don't find a reason to wake up anymore. And so I'm going to kill myself and I'm going to do it at the campground where we last hung out after graduation senior year. Um, and he sends them that suicide email. And right before he kills himself at the campground, they all show up to stop him. And they try to talk him into why life is worth living and that you can, you can be the change that you want to be. If, if, if you do want to change, you don't have to let depression get the best of you. Um, but little do they know there's an escaped mass killer psychopath in the woods getting ready to pick them all off one by one. And Matt, the lead character, then is confronted with really, OK, do you want to live or do you want to die? Because here, you know, you have to make an active decision. Sure. And I, I guess it's a spoiler, but I guess it's also in the title. All your friends are dead. So <laughs> that lets you know kind of what happens, except for that is only in the halfway mark of the movie. And when I mentioned the last 20 minutes of Friday the 13th earlier, I did that in a way to say that we decided to move that last 20 minutes up and to be the middle of the movie. So then you get all that action, you get all that gore, and everything you loved in those those last bits of the Friday the 13th movie at the halfway mark in the second act. And then if you were to press pause while watching this movie, you'd go, oh, I still have 35, 40 minutes left. What is going to happen? Sure. And so that's the part of the movie that I think horror fans are really going to love because as an educated audience of film and especially the horror genre, we are kind of smarter than some of the movies right now where we're able to guess two or three steps ahead of it mm. and the the twist isn't a twist that will upset an audience of like oh you just did a twist to make a twist i think they're going to really appreciate it because then that third act still just keeps on roller coastering up with the gore and the horror that's that's very cool and i i i like the idea that obviously you put thought into this you know this isn't just like this will happen this will happen yeah that'd be quite cool i'll be reached the end did a there you go it's you know you you obviously have played this out you've thought about this a lot and and you're you're following a particular uh track you know particular plan which i really think is very cool um when when your kickstarter goes live i'm sure you will have videos and everything else and i will put the link up uh for that but if anyone's watching this now, uh, early days of the kickstarting campaign and things and everything you you just said still is brilliant and still stands and can be watched even when the campaign is over. But um, anyone watching it, hopefully in the next couple of days, um, how could you sum up why they should uh, basically support your campaign and either spread it, spread it all around and hopefully maybe donate some money to you? Well, and then we will happily take whatever donation but like we purposely made for this crowdfunding campaign we've we've noticed that other crowdfunds they offer like a thousand perks and it's pretty overwhelming there's too many perks to choose from so we offered three for twenty dollars you get a social media shout out that's us thanking you and letting the world know whoever can i i, I want to say contribute instead of donate because donate makes it sound like we're we're destitute 
<laughs> so sure. contribute is because you're helping an idea and you're helping creatives. And as we talked earlier, you are helping the indie film market. Um, a lot of crowd funds for movies are hard because they they're promising you that they're going to do something with your money. We are doing that too, except for we already shot half the movie. Like this thing is happening. And that was very important for us before we launched this campaign and to show that teaser trailer. This movie's happening, but you should donate because it's going to help us complete it quicker and better with the sound mix, the post-production, the color grading, the editing. Um, people often don't realize how much it costs to submit it to festivals. And that's the best way to get it in front of a distributor. So then the second perk is your name in the credits. And you also get that social media shout out for 50 bucks. You will be synonymous with this movie, whether it's awful and it's like the, the new Tommy Wiseau's the, the Room, or if it ends up going down the pantheons of modern slasher films, um, you will always be in the movie in the credits. The final one is the Blu-ray. It's limited to 100 copies. And it will have an exclusive commentary that will only be on this release. And I say that because if this movie, fingers crossed, gets bought or distributed, there's going to be a repackaging of it. And we won't have really, really the control of when that is released. So this commentary will only be on this release. And you'll get this Blu-ray between August 2022 and October 2022. So you know you'll have this movie a, almost a year from now where if you aren't one of the 100 people that get this Blu-ray, who knows when you'll be able to see this movie. Sure, sure. That's, so that's pretty it's cool. It's really important uh, to get that. Um, anyone who's just interested in, in yourself and making of the film and even after the Kickstarter has been a massive success and you've raised money, um what's what's the best way to kind of follow you guys are you on social media all that sort of thing um yeah twitter twitter is a good one i'll always be posting the updates for the the campaign because it lasts from august 30th to september 30th we'll be also posting updates because there are other things that we filmed that we want to tease you with and some storyboards of kills that you're not seeing in that teaser some of the things that i talked about that happened in that third act that um one is a hedge trimmer to the gut kill, uh, which is pretty gnarly. Um, follow me on Twitter at Ricky Glore. That's R-I-C-K-Y-G-L-O-R-E. There'll probably be a link in the show notes. And Instagram at Glore Ricky. Um, you can also follow our YouTube account, which is All Your Friends Are Dead movie. And also on facebook if you want to see a lot more of my comedy but i'll also post updates about the movie it's facebook.com slash ricky glore comedy cool i will put all the links up uh with, with this when when we go live um all i want to say is uh thank you for having uh, a chat with us today right now i mean it's brilliant what we've gone through i mean you we've gone through it really super quick and i'm sure we could talk about this for much, much longer and um you know, it'd be great to speak to you guys maybe after after the campaign and sort of catch up then and, you know, keep keep uh, uh, sort of an eye on um, how your progress is going. Because, yeah, it sounds it sounds really cool and it is different enough from every other sort of indie horror film out there. But the kind of people I think probably should uh, pay attention, you know. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And that's. Just um, when you were talking about earlier, it being thought out, one of the things that we thought about was so many of the horror movies are based like a little bit of a joke is that like, oh, they're teenagers, but they're played by 35 year olds. Yeah. Well, when you're 20, 15 years later to 35 seems like a lifetime, seems like forever. You can't even fathom it. It seems like yeah. time travel. Um, when you're 35, the 15 year between 35 and 50 seems a lot shorter and your sensibilities are a lot yeah. different. Yeah, absolutely. 